a little bit after nine, so. If you're a visitor with us and nobody said welcome, uh, welcome. I don't know that I just see any visitors here right now, but uh, we are certainly glad to have you. And then we're also glad to have all of our regular, our members here. It's always good to see everybody. Always good to see everybody. Um, Brent is, he is gone right now, so, and he has been helping Ray and I uh, get the class covered, so we want to keep... Uh, him in our prayers as he travels. Uh, we're going to be studying, when we have been studying the book of Ecclesiastes, and we're going to be in chapter 7, verse 15, starting out. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, um, we got just a few things before we get started. Um, oh, I do want to welcome those that are also... Um, viewing this remotely uh, in YouTube. Uh, we quit streaming those actually live, um, and we re go ahead and record them, and then we put them up on the website uh, fairly quickly. So anyway, I wanna, I wanna welcome those folks as well. So before we get started, uh, we do have a few things I wanna mention. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how many people are on this uh, email thread, but. Uh, Joe Duran has a friend, Seth Johnson, whose father uh, was the preacher from the, uh, I'll try to say that right, Tarentum, uh, Pennsylvania congregation, where Joe was converted. Um, Seth has asked for prayers for his parents, Robert and Kathy Johnson, because they are quite ill with COVID. His mom is currently worse, but is, but is in the hospital and getting some treatment that seems to be helping. His dad has COVID, but is still home. Um, Seth's brother Caleb and his family also has COVID. So let's pray for them all, uh, especially for Seth's parents. Uh, it says they're one, those are wonderful people and they mean a lot to Joe and his family and the Pennsylvania brethren. And then John Haynes, um, he evidently has lost his brother. Um, his brother passed away. So we need to keep the Haynes family in the prayers. And then, uh, of course, uh, RC, Donna, we've got, we've got you in our prayers you and your family with the loss of RC. And then Jesse Lee's mother passed away, so we need to keep her and her family in our prayers. And then uh, Zo Susan Zebarth is in the Mocaine Nursing Home. And then has anybody heard anything more on Pam Brodsky and how she's doing? Anybody have a, nobody have an update? Mike, was you were over there yesterday? Right. Okay. So so Pam has Bell's palsy, and uh, but she's coming along. I think is kind of where we're interviewing it. Okay. And then uh, of course we're always happy to see Ray. I think Ray's on the road to recovery, and he's had some good news. You know, he's. I don't think he has to have uh, any follow-up radiation. I think he has a an appointment on Wednesday, um, and hopefully the doctors will release him, and then he'll be on like every. What did you say? I mean, what kind of a schedule? Five. Next five years. All right. So that's always good. And then we want to remember John Watson, too. Um, he's actually been moved up on the transplant plant list, which is excellent. So we know John has, has really been having problems uh, with his health. Oh, uh, okay. Right, right. Well, he's pretty high on the list then, if they're calling him. Okay, so he had he had a call, did you say Friday night? Yeah. yeah, and then he went up there, but it turned out that uh, it wasn't compatible enough to, to do the transplant. So, so anyway, we need to keep uh, John and Linda and, and all that family in our prayers. So is there anybody else uh, that needs to be mentioned in our opening prayer this morning? Uh, 
Carrie. Okay. Oh, okay. Thought we were going to be done with all that by now, right? Did you say Phil Jones? Okay. Um, anybody else? I'm sorry, Phil Jones, a uh, friend of Kathy Feely. Um, he had COVID and had COVID, and, but he has now passed away. So he's on our prayer list, on the bulletin there, I guess, uh, in the bulletin. So, Yeah, and if you need me to repeat something, you know, I try to remember that, but uh, please uh, just ask me to. I'll be happy to. Anybody else? All right, so let's go ahead and bow our head for a word of prayer this morning before we get started. Our gracious, most kind, and loving Heavenly Father, we're so very thankful for this day and this time to come before you. Father, our hearts are hurting. We have loss that we have to deal with. We have a lot of people that are sick. And Father, we want to bring them and their names before your throne. Father says family is struggling with COVID. They're the friends of the Durans and are the ones that helped convert Joe. And Father, we just pray for that church family up there and, and their family as well, and that they recover and that uh, restored health is gained. And Father, we pray for John Haynes, the loss of his brother. Pray for Donna Robinson and the Robinson family with the loss of R.C., Jesse Lee with the loss of her mother. Father, we struggle with loss because we're human, and we don't understand a lot of times why this life has to come to an end at the point it does. But, Father, we have hope in the resurrection, the hope guaranteed through your Son that our suffering will be eased and that our dear brothers and sisters are headed to a much better place. And, Father, that gives us confidence and assurance throughout our day. Father, we know there are a lot of sick people, but there also have been people that recovered. And we would be remiss if we didn't bring those people before your throne. We're bringing Susan Zebarth. We know that she's in the Mocaine Nursing Home. We ask that um, she be restored and that the people that are actually working with all these folks that you give them the guidance they need to help make them better. And we're thankful for Ray and his recovery. Father, we just, we always stand in awe of your, your greatness. We humble ourselves before your love. And we're thankful for all the blessings that you give us. And Father, we want to pray for John Watson, the fact that he's been moved up on the transplant list and gets ever closer to getting what he needs to be able to rejoin us again we're thankful for, and of course our hearts are heavy with the passing of Phil Jones, who's a friend of Kathy Feely, due to COVID. Father, we pray as we go through and we study your word that we're able to glean the things that we need to help us in this life and the life to come. Father, we're so grateful with for all the words that you've given us, those great words that bring us the amount of peace that we need to carry on throughout our lives. And the fact that we get to study Ecclesiastes and learn from one of the wisest men ever put on the earth is such a blessing. And as we go through and we study this, we pray that our hearts are receptive to your word and to your love. And if we fall short, we ask your forgiveness for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so... <clears throat> So Brent, uh, he made it through uh, chapter 7, verse 15 last week, and that's where we're going to start. Um, one of the things he mentioned, too, was um, what's like the, one of the phrases that's mentioned pretty frequently throughout the book of Ecclesiastes? There's, there's some, but there's one in particular I kind of want, want you to keep in mind. And that would be, 
Under the sun. Absolutely, Ray. Under the sun. So, and what's that mean, Ray? Everywhere. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. That's exactly right. So Ray said it means it's pretty much everywhere. It's everywhere. It happens to everybody on this earth. So the first seven chapters of the book of Ecclesiastes describe all the worldly things under the sun that the preacher tries to find fulfillment in. He found that everything was meaningless and only a temporary diversion that, without God, had no purpose or longevity. So I'll say it again that he found that everything was meaningless and a temporary diversion or distraction, but without God, that none of this has any purpose or longevity. For all the vanities described in the book of Ecclesiastes, the answer is what? What's the answer to all the vanities? Right. And I think somebody said God or Christ. Yep, absolutely. God or Christ. Um, God judges the righteous and the wicked. God has placed the desire for eternity in our hearts, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. And we are reminded that striving after the world's wealth is not only vanity because it does not satisfy, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 10, but if we could attain it without Christ, we would lose our souls. And ultimately, every disappointment and vanity described in Ecclesiastes, remedy is Christ. The wisdom of God and the only true meaning found in life. And that uh, life apart from God can be frustrating, cruel, unfair, brief, and utterly meaningless. But with Christ, life, life is but a shadow of the glories to come in heaven. And that is only accessible through him. So the first, ver- the first 14 verses of chapter 7 contrast man's desires with God's wisdom. And in, fif- in verses 15 through 22, which is what we'll be looking at today, um, we're going to be learning to live reasonably on this earth or your pride can take you down. So is there any, I mean, that's kind of a quick synopsis of, of where we've gotten to, how we've gotten to where we're at so far. But uh, are there any comments that anybody would like to make before we get started in verse 15? Okay. All right. So Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 15. I have seen everything during my life of futility. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in wickedness. So what is, what is who's, who's observed this, or who, who's he speaking of? The preacher. Who, who is the preacher that we've, we've talked about so far? Solomon, yeah, Solomon, that's right. So, so he's speaking of, in Solomon's lifetime, and what has he observed? What, is a, what has he observed? Hey, thank you, Rick. There is a righteous, yep. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in wickedness. Verse 16. Do not be excessively righteous, and do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? Do not, in verse 17, do not be excessively wicked, and do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? So what's his, what's his conclusion? What's his conclusion? Right. So, so basically, do not be excessively righteous or overly wise. Is that saying that you shouldn't be righteous or wise? 
No, I see a lot of a lot of head shaking. That's good. Okay, so uh, it says, um, "Don't be excessively uh, righteous or overly wise." But that's not to say that you shouldn't be righteous and wise. What happens though when when people are are thought of themselves think of themselves as uh, overly righteous or overly wise? I hear a lot of a lot of talking, but I can't hear what's being. Self-righteous, right? Self-righteous is one of the things that come to mind. Um, say that again. They, ha- they have a tendency to forget that they're still sinners as well. Absolutely, right? All fall short. Okay, so uh, that's exactly right. Um, you know, sometimes people who are overly wich- righteous or overly wise, we kind of call them, a, and they're, they're more than willing to share what they know. Um, we have, they have a tendency to be what we call the term as a, as a know-it-all. Um, and then what's the caution there? What's the caution there in that verse? You could ruin yourself. Absolutely. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, you could ruin yourself. So there's a caution there. Um, any other comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, it, it sure sounds like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's the way we view ourselves, Richard. That's how, that's how I read it, is that uh, basically we think more of ourselves than what we really, we really are, is where I, what, how I read that. Uh, yeah, right. So and I, I think you're totally on the right track there. So he, he talked about how when the uh, Pharisees or came to Christ and uh, or and they said, you know, why would a physician need? Uh, it's not a physician that needs healing. So um, I go along with certain lines of thinking of if I already think I know it all, then how can I be instructed? That's that's kind of kind of where I'm at on that. So does anybody else have any other comments on that? Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, I, I think I think it's a reference to. So uh, what Madison's saying is is that in Proverbs twenty five. Yeah, so, well, I would think that when it talks to you, not, do not eat excessively an amount of honey. You know, it, honey's very, very rich and sweet, so it can, it can cause you to be ill or something like that. So I think the, the thinking along is along the same lines. And then anybody jump in here and just, I'll get you checking here in just a second. But uh, that same way with, you know, how being uh, excessively righteous, you know, or being excessively wise is not necessarily a good thing because it kind of keeps you from, you know, it can ruin you. I guess it's in the same way with that. So that's where I got, that's where I was thinking of that, yeah. Mm-hmm. I can't. Yeah, yeah. I guess, I guess it could be. Yeah, I, yep, I don't, I don't know for sure. Chuck. Right. 
Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can lull us into a false sense of security. Yeah, yeah. So, and I'll try to re summarize that as best I can. But pretty much, we have to be in the same. In, our thinking has to be in the same accordance in our assessment of ourselves, in, in the same accordance as what God's is. So, in other words, we don't want to view ourselves as, as excessively righteous or excessively wise, because again, um, that could lead uh, lead you towards you know ruination. Ray. Okay. Right. Sure. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So. Uh, Ray was commenting on Madison's comment, and that, so that's a, a man reference, you know, cross-reference to that particular uh, verse in the Bible. Uh, and then the second thing is, is, tell me the second thing again. Right. Yeah, yeah, self-righteousness, self-glorification, um, you know, when you have those kind of things going on, where's your humility at? Absolutely. Okay, Romans 12, 3 is the reference. you want to read that for us? Then you ought. So don't think more highly of yourself um, than, than you ought. Absolutely. Yep. Valerie, did you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So she talked about Proverbs 25 again. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry, Richard. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, yeah, we're not to be wicked at all. I think what is drawn, the contrast of the excessiveness of both, both directions, um, for sure. So, because in verse 17, do not be excessively wicked and do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? Yep. Uh, Matt. Okay, so what I've got, so this is, this is what I've got. So, yeah, ver, so verse 18, uh, it is good that you grasp one thing and also not let go of the other. For the one who fears God comes forth with both of them. And what I've got is this explains the previous verses. Um, what's the key? Fear God, keep his commandments, absolutely. So, and we are wise because of listening to God and righteous because of Jesus and not because of ourselves. So. Yep, I absolutely. Yep. Right. Yep. Yep. 
So very good comments. Very good comments. Um, I'll tell you what, let's do, uh, let's go to Psalms 73. We'll come back to Ecclesiastes. So Psalm 73, I'm going to go ahead and read that um, so we can, we can get it on the video and just in the, for the sense of time. So I'll read uh, verses 1 through 14. I'm sorry, 1 through 9 first. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling... My steps had almost slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore pride is, is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eye bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue parades through the earth. So do you see how the writer almost went to ruin in verses 1 through 9, and how his focus became on what? In verses 1 through 9, what did his focus be, uh, become on? Or what did he focus on? The ungodliness, right? Yeah, he was he was focusing on all the ungodliness, all the things that the wicked had have. Um, verses ten through fourteen. Therefore, his people return to this place, and waters of abundance are drunk by them. They say, "How does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, and always at ease." They have increased in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. For I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. So what's he looking at? What's the writer looking at there? Kind of looking at uh, verses 13 in particular. Yeah, he's looking at his own righteousness and then wondering why the wicked are prospering. Okay, verse uh, 16 and 17. When I pondered to understand this, it was quite, it was troublesome in my sight. Until I came into the sanctuary of God, then I perceived their end. So what did he understand? What did he understand in verses 16 and 17? Yeah, so you're right, uh, Valerie. It's 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 in the it's in the in the verses. When I pondered to understand this, it was quite troublesome in my sight until I came to the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived therein. Absolutely. Uh, verses 21 and 22. When my heart was embittered and I and I was pierced, then I was, sense, then I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. So, walking with God, he perceived himself. And then verses 23 and 24, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand, and with your counsel you will guide me, and afterward receive me to glory. So that's basically what Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 18 says. So what's the point? We have to keep a balance we, when we fear God and simply walk with him where he directs. Any other comments on that?
You know, I have to tell you, when I go through and I read this and I study it, and I, I personally, like, until I really start diving into the meaning of these things, um, you know, it, it can be a little, little vague for me. So I, I really recommend, um, like, I can't ponder on this in a minute and honestly get it. I'm just not that sharp, you know? So I have to go through and I have to spend some time uh, actually going through and looking at it and trying to look at some of the verses and some of the different things that are out there about it because, um, you know, I'm just like everybody else. I'm constantly learning. So, okay, in verse 19, wisdom strengthens, a w- I'm sorry, we're back in Ecclesiastes. Yep. In chapter 7. So, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 19. Wisdom strengthens a wise man more than ten rulers who are in the city. What do you learn about the value of wisdom there? What do you learn about? Yeah, it's important. Um, It gives them strength. Um, What's the strength of wisdom versus the strength of rulers? How many rulers? Yeah. The strength of a wise man, more than ten rulers who are in the city. Absolutely. Uh, verse 20, Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. Matt just kind of talked about that a little bit. So we're still working off of verse 16, which is the excessively righteousness, right? Indeed, there is not, verse 20, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. So what can one who is excessively righteous forget? That they still sin, absolutely, that they still sin. Um, And they're, that, and they're, Really, they're not, they're not above others. That's exactly right. Verse 21, also do not take seriously all words which are spoken, so that you will not hear your servant cursing you. So here's wisdom, right? What's it saying? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's pro- Yeah. There's, there's probably somebody out there who has, has something against you and does say things against you. Um, verse 21, also do not take seriously all words which are spoken so that you will not hear your servant cursing you. So if we would hear him, we might hear something we wouldn't like, right? We might hear something we wouldn't like. So, cursing here could be like the idea of slander of some type. Um, did you ever notice somebody take something personal and twist it? So, again, you know, this is like, you know, we, this is kind of the wisdom part of it, right? Um, so, we're not to take, we're not to take um, everything others say about us and take it to heart because it might not be First off, it might not be accurate. Second thing, it might cause us to focus on what's being said about us. And the next thing is, is we might we might not hear what we like. What we might hear something we don't like. Any other comments on that? You guys are making it really easy on me today. I like it. Um, For you also have realized that, like you, or pardon me. For you also have realized that you likewise have many times cursed others. That's verse 22. So, have, have, we, have any of us ever been guilty about saying something bad about another? Have we ever had said something in a, in a, like a, in a moment where we were really thinking about what we were, we weren't thinking about what we really said? I know I have. Chuck has. He's got his hand up. Yes, Chuck. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yep. Yep. God's desire is for um, us to control ourselves. What's the Bible say about the tongue? Say that again, sir. Yeah, he who bridles the tongue bridles the body. Yeah, that goes along with keeping command of yourself. But what are we? We're human beings, right? And we do make mistakes. And we do that sometimes out of haste and honestly, you know, just out of uh, a wrong attitude. So what would happen if you did say something like that and somebody did take that to heart? You certainly wouldn't be doing them any good. So be careful about what you listen to uh, from others and don't take it too seriously. But also you want to be careful about what you say. So in verses 23, in Ecclesiastes, uh, verses 23 through 26, we're going to talk about like the real meaning of life. It's kind of shrouded in mystery, and by man's wisdom you can't understand it. So verse 23 I tested all this with wisdom, and I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. What has been, is verse 24, what has been is remote and exceedingly mysterious. Who can discover it? So what did Solomon find? I tested all this with wisdom, and I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. What did Solomon find out? Yeah, yeah. I always, always like, you know, the, I like this part. Uh, the answer is in the, in the, in, right in there, right? It says, I tested all of this with wisdom, and I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. What has been is remote and exceedingly mysterious. Who can discover it? Wisdom alone isn't the answer. Um, wisdom doesn't provide the answers of life and righteousness. So look, look back, hold your, hold your place, but look back at Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11 to remind us what God's done. Okay, verse 11. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart. Yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. And then um, go ahead and, and turn to Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. Okay, verse 33 of Romans chapter 11. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the, of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and unfathomable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him, that it might be paid back to him again? For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen the magnitude of God's greatness, right? Okay, so let's turn back to Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 25. I directed my mind to know, to investigate, and to seek wisdom and an explanation, and to know the evil of folly and the foolishness of madness. So where does Solomon turn his attention to now? I directed my mind to know, to investigate, to seek the wisdom and an explanation and to know the evil of folly and the foolishness of madness. Where does Solomon turn his attention to? I directed my mind to know, right, to investigate, to seek wisdom and an explanation and to know the evil of folly and the foolishness of madness. He turns his attention there. Using every amount of his ability given, his mind to know and investigate. Remember, he just told us that it's not good to be overly wise. 
verse 26. And I discovered more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are chains. One who is pleasing to God will escape from her, but the sinner will be captured by her. What does wisdom teach him? What's wisdom teach him? I discovered more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are, are chains. But one who, or one who is pleasing to God will escape from her, but the sinner will capture, be captured by her. You may remember what happened with Solomon? Right? Yep. Absolutely. Yep, those who are well-pleasing to God will escape that. But uh, Solomon did fall into that same trap himself. So, Okay, uh, verses 27 through 29. Verse 27. Behold, I have discovered this, says the preacher, adding one thing to another to find an explanation. Behold, I have discovered this, says the preacher, adding one thing to another to find an explanation. So this is where his insight has brought him. His life has been a constant search, moving everywhere but God and his word. Verse 28, which I am still seeking but have not found. I have found one man among a thousand, but I have not found a woman among all these. You can almost hear the discouragement, in it, and, but he's still seeking. And what's he looking for there? An upright, right? Someone who is upright. Behold, verse 29, Behold, I have found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. Uh, when he says men there, um, that's man in general, meaning men and women. That's, that's kind of what I got there. Um, man was created in the image of God. God made man upright, but man corrupts themselves by their own desires and devices. So, any comments or questions on that? That is the end of chapter 7, so... Uh, Chuck. So sometimes when we go down a road that we weren't supposed to go down, there's lessons within that. But ultimately, the lesson is is that we need to come back to God. And it should, absolutely. All right, all right that's all I have for today. I do thank you for your attention and your attendance.